Hello my friends, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kayla and I pretty much, like I say all the time, have told you about a lot of these books already. So, oh my god, I haven't had caffeine today. I just realized how tired I sound. Um, I talked about these books in two big vlogs this month. One where I read other booktubers favorite books of 2020 and one where I read my childhood favorites. There are a couple books that don't fit into those that you haven't heard me talk about yet but without further ado we'll dive in. How should I organize it this time? Let's go in rainbow order. So starting with red. I read a book called Whites. This is called Whites on Race and Other Falsehoods by Otega Uegba and it is an essay, essentially an exploration or assessment of white allies, uh, the things that she has noticed, experienced, observed throughout her entire life and more specifically since the murder of George Floyd, how white people have responded, how white people are interacting differently um, on the internet from her being included on like anti-racist book lists when her previous book had nothing to do with that to the influx of white guilt in her inbox. I feel weird trying to sum this up uh, in my own words so let me just read you a passage. The exercise of anti-racism re reading encourages white people to satisfy, even exhaust themselves with swatting up on the semantics of the struggle without necessarily translating that knowledge into real world action. It's relatively easy to be a theoretical anti-racist. Anti-racist reading often constitutes mere filibustering, white people learning about their privilege and power without ever having to sacrifice either. It's essentially a lot of ideas that I've seen brought forward by a lot of my friends in the book community um, as of late, but it's just in a really concise, raw, honest way. I really appreciate it and I think a lot of other people will as well, or are already. I gave that five stars and now I don't know where to go because these are all red and brown. Let's do Ghostwood Song by Erica Waters. This is a story of a girl named Shady and it's like set in the real world but it has magical stuff going on. She has this magical fiddle. Her father had a magical fiddle. He passed away. Um, there's a lot going on in her life and with her family. Her brother has just been accused of a crime and to like find out the truth she wants to raise some ghosts which involves this fiddle and her father's fiddle has been calling to her and she's deciding like what to do with that and what she's willing to sacrifice for the truth. The atmosphere of this is my favorite part. It is stunning, it's gothic, it's southern. There are really good descriptions of every setting. It's super atmospheric. I love the mix of paranormal and reality but I do wish that it was balanced a little bit differently. But at the same time like I felt that the characterization while good was lacking in relation to each other like I wanted more banter and fun and friendship between all of the characters I just wanted more of that while at the same time I don't feel like we got enough of the paranormal vibes not enough ghost stuff not enough fantasy so maybe I just wish it was like a hundred pages longer would be the solution I give it three stars I think it handled a lot of really good topics. It was just like an okay nice time, not a fantastic reading experience for me. Next let's do this one because it's a little more like brown. This one's a little more yellow which is next in the, the rainbow. This is 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act by Bob Joseph, helping Canadians make reconciliation with Indigenous peoples a reality. This is one of the best nonfictions I've ever read. I just think it introduces a lot of ideas in a very easy to understand way and it's organized wonderfully. You know how much I appreciate the organization of a book. Chapters from history to like what we can do in the future. There's also a list of calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. There's also a list of book recommendations and further reading to do. There's also classroom, a classroom discussion guide in here. There's a lot packed into a 180 page book. While already familiar with the Indian Act, I didn't realize how many like changes and amendments have been made to it over time um, and how those changes while under the guise of like 
encouraging positivity towards the indigenous communities in the country. We're actually just continuing to harm the population. I think this is a really good introduction um, just to the idea of residential schools and renaming people and stopping access to like cultural celebrations and families and traditions and land, how it all began and the journey that has happened um, and the idea of self-governance and how that works and how that could work and just this is a good jumping off point that I really recommend to everybody. Next we'll do Scythe by Neil Shusterman. This is a future setting where the world has evolved to a state where there is no hunger or death or war or general misery and because of the need not to die that's like accomplished by people resetting their ages but in order to have some population control, there is this group, uh, like a self-governing um, group of people called Scythes, who glean people or kill them. We're following two characters who are apprentice Scythes who like don't want to be, but that's the whole thing is like the people who don't want to be are probably the best chosen for this job in society this role because you know that they have good intent my favorite thing about reading this is probably the fact that like you know that these characters are good and moral and that's just kind of a safe reading experience but at the same time it kind of makes the stakes low which is what you come to expect from like YA sci-fi and dystopian stories so while I enjoyed learning about the world and reading about these characters I at no point felt really invested in the story so any like reveals or twists or whatever was going on n nothing felt like that impactful overall while it was fun and I thought it was different and I've heard from a lot of people this is a really good setup for the series and there's a lot going on that you don't even know about um this is just like a small introduction so when you get to the bigger ideas and the things that are really going on you're not lost with that said i don't plan to continue in the series but i thought this was fun for what it was i'm glad that i have had the experience so now when everybody talks about it because it's like one of the beloved ya series that i see mentioned on booktube i at least have the background knowledge to like slightly participate in the conversation. Next up, do we have any orange books? Ooh, this one is like a, this is a whole bunch of colors, but it's kind of orangey red. This is The Sleepover Friends, number five, Lauren's Big Mix Up, in which Lauren loses her suitcase poor girl and she has to like borrow clothes and she spends her weekend in New York City with her friends trying to track down her suitcase. A lot of fun things happen. I'm not going to rate this book. I forgot to tell you my rating for this was a three. I might have forgotten to tell you this was a five but you probably assumed that. I read this for the first time when I was probably like nine years old. The nostalgia was real. Would I recommend this to current eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds? sure moving right along this one is yellow orangey gold i think this makes sense to go next the song of achilles by madeline miller this is a story of Tro Trocleus and achilles and their love story this is kind of an accumulation of a lot of things i don't traditionally love in books but i gave it a 3.75 which is pretty good godhood romance, historical, following characters for a very lengthy time. The book opens um, with introducing all of these characters, whether you're familiar with them or otherwise. I think she does a really great job of subtly introducing each character to like kind of jog your memory of who they are and why they matter. I really love that opening scene. I really loved learning about Patroclus and him being exiled. Um, and Achilles kind of taking him under his wing in this new land. From there, there is a kidnapping and the Trojan War and everything that goes on leading up to that and during that and after that. It's very interesting reading about Achilles from the perspective of somebody who is in love with him because I think the way that he gets described and his like downfalls are just seen 
from a different view which is really interesting. I've really gone in a deep dive about the story of Achilles in the last like couple days. So there was absolutely beautiful language. I understand why everybody loves this. Um, these characters and how they love each other and the ways that they describe each other is really lovely. I just wanted a little bit more. Like Achilles is the greatest warrior of all time and he's described in certain ways and seen in certain ways but I just wanted more little moments between these characters especially at the beginning of their friendship or relationship um i wanted more like evidence and scenes where you could see why they cared for each other so much and i wanted more of like a slow burn i guess okay what's next this one is like a yellowy green so i feel like it should go next the Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter by Theodora Goss. This is a story of Mary Jekyll and her father was killed recently. She lost her parents and she is now trying to hunt down Edward Hyde who is responsible for her father's death. And on this journey she meets a whole bunch of other characters, um, other daughters of people, other experiments and creatures like Hyde's daughter and Frankenstein's daughter. She also links up with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and they're all on this adventure together. And this is written like we're being told, like it's a book within a book, like the story is being told to us. Um, the girls are putting together the story and they will interject um, and have little like explanations of what was really going on what didn't make it into this final book and it's a really fun read i love the gimmick it's got all the buzzwords for me it's a little bit magical it's a found family it's a girl gang it's about feminism but i didn't end up really getting what i wanted out of it so i definitely think that the love for this is warranted but going into this knowing that it's about solving a mystery I wanted there to be a lot more like thrilling moments and suspense and rather than just like one storyline I hoped or I think I would have loved it more if like we went off on a lot of different side adventures and there was more red herrings and more like different various reveals as opposed to just like one intriguing mystery. It was more about the girls friendship and coming together which is a lovely story in itself. What they learn from each other, how they interact, but it's just not exactly my type of book. Especially because it is like historical and set in Victorian times. I could have done without the constant use of the word savage and like the negativity towards sex work but I think that is what you could call appropriate um, for the timeline. I gave it three stars. So it was fine. Again, I won't be continuing the series, but I've heard it's good. It feels kind of like a love letter to literature, which is always cool. Next up, my most green book even has green in the title. Across the Green Grass Fields by Sean and McGuire. This was another three star. It's weird because when I reflect on my reading month, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was great. Like I read so many great things. But there were a lot of three star middle of the road reads. This is my least favorite in the Wayward Children series. However, I think if you're just wanting to get into it and you feel like the series is already so many books deep that you don't want to catch up and you just want to read the newest release and see if you like it, this is the moment to do it because this is its own like standalone story. Every book features characters who go into these different worlds. They're children who find a portal and they end up in the perfect world for them. In this one, Regan is running away from her family. Um, she just got the news uh, that she is intersex, which she did not know previous. And as her body um, has not been changing the same way that she's seen other little girls around her, she's questioning what's going on. Her parents finally um, reveal like the truth to her. And from there, she really doesn't know how to feel about anyone in her life or about herself. So she ends up in this world um, of acceptance and love. And it's mostly kelpies and cent centaur focused um there's unicorns it's all of these different um 
horse-like creatures in this world. I will always love this series as a whole because the Wayward Children and Eleanor West's home and how it all comes back to that is my favorite part. And I'm assuming we're going to see Regan perhaps even in the next book in the series and how she will come to interact with the other children or maybe we're even in like a completely different timeline. I don't know. I'm still very excited um, to be reading the series that it keeps coming out. I will continue to promote it because there are children in the home that I cannot wait for their stories and I'm obviously so um, appreciative of being sent that as an arc and getting to read it and sharing it with you. So moving on. Hi me again. Uh, this is what I get for filming my wrap up a day early because now it's the end of January and I finished a whole nother book. I could have waited until my February wrap up but I did read it in January and it's green so it fits in perfectly right here and the publisher sent it to me and it's an early February release so I wanted to include it. So this is Love is a Revolution by Renee Watson, my probably fourth Renee Watson. Uh, it's right in the middle of my favorites. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I thought it was good so I'm giving it like a three and a half close to a four. I'll probably round up to a four on Goodreads. In the story we're following a girl named Nala and she is discovering herself. She's learning about herself throughout the book. I love stories where we just get a fat character existing. That's not the storyline but she's thriving. There is a little bit of it in the story because her cousin who she now lives with because um, her relationship with her mother is rocky which I wish we got a little bit more of in the book is like one of my main critiques. Her cousin Imani feels it really important that she reclaims the word fat and Nala doesn't necessarily feel that way. In general she doesn't have a lot in common with the group of people that she's spending time with throughout this book who are really involved in like justice and social events and activism. I love how Renee Watson writes such different main characters who have completely different perspectives on the world because Nala isn't in that scene. She's just living her life while people around her are volunteering places and caring about the environment and she gets involved with this boy and she pretends uh, that she cares about a lot of the things that he does. She pretends she's doing work at this senior home. She pretends to be a vegetarian because that's how she can have something in common with this boy. And throughout the book she knows that she's doing the wrong thing but she's kind of stuck in this process of finding out who she is in general, what she does care about, and trying to find the right moment to tell him the truth because she just wants to be loved. I'm sure in other videos and in my upcoming vlog in which I read this during like an arc reading week, I have referred to this as a YA contemporary romance. I don't feel like that's what it is. It's not a romance. I think that the relationship is really strategically placed in this book so the character, the main character can learn something and us as a reader can learn something but I don't think they're compatible and I don't think the intent of the book is for you to look for and hope for these like awesome moments of them together. I think their relationship is super important to both of their like life journeys um, but they want to change each other so much throughout the book whether their intentions are good or bad and they do teach each other things throughout the story but I just don't think that the overall goal of the book is to like root for this relationship because the chemistry did not exist for me. I think there'll be a lot of different perspectives on it liking the main character being aggravated with the main character loving the relationship maybe thinking the relationship isn't the best. There's a lot of different viewpoints and feelings that this book could evoke and I'm excited to watch more people read it and see their thoughts. So that's that. Back to yesterday. Moving on to a bluey green cover. This is The 21 Balloons by William Penne Dubois and I originally read this in school. It was a classroom book. We all read it together and then I hadn't thought about it until 20 plus years later. Here we are. It's a story of this guy who is flying a balloon 
a hot air balloon and he crashes on Krakatoa which is an island known for its like volcanic eruptions and he thinks and the world thinks that nobody lives there and that it's uninhabitable and he learns that there is an entire um, group of families who lives there and there are diamonds and they're all like owning part of um, the island and they're sharing in the wealth and they're sharing in like food and every family has their own restaurant and it's like this perfect happy utopian setting which in the time that it came out was um, I think a very much needed escape for people. I again don't want to rate this because it's like a childhood reread but it was just okay. I, w I don't know if I would recommend it to current day children just because of some of the outdated like terminology and I just think there are better adventure stories like I thought this was more of an adventure story than it actually is. It's just a lot of math for 200 pages. Next in my blues or ceruleans house in the house in the cerulean sea by tj clune this is a fantasy contemporary story i think this is kind of more for contemporary lovers than for fantasy lovers because uh, i think there's a lot of like convenient things within like the magic system and it's not something uh to really like dive into and pull apart and try to understand. It's more just a fun story with a lot of really great social commentary. We're following a character named Linus who works for like this company who um, looks into the orphanages who are taking care of magical youth. He is a very like strict worker, does his job well, so they trust him to take on this high profile case where there are some very specifically dangerous children who could bring about like the end of the world and he's also been tasked at looking into the person who's running the facility which is not something typically in his job descriptions. The children in this book are fantastic, they're so lovable. The relationship between Linus and the person running the orphanage, Arthur, is lovely and it's a book where you already know how it's gonna go from the beginning. You already come to understand that this is about the children and about the home but it's a bigger story about Linus and his realizations about the world. I'm losing my voice. I don't know what to tell you. It's one of the most fun books I've ever read. Um, I really enjoyed myself. I didn't think that this was going to be for me because just like this didn't give me the vibe that I traditionally go for but it was absolutely a five star. Let's get into another one of my favorite fictions of the month uh, and that's The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. This kicks off with a pretty um, dark beginning where we have a character named Nora who isn't sure she wants to live anymore and it takes her into this strange between life and death situation where she's in this library. She has like a spirit guide who is allowing her to dip her toe into different experiences. Everybody has regrets. Everybody um, thinks about what would my life be like if I had taken this different path or done this differently and she gets to experience what her life is like in all of these alternate realities. My favorite thing about this is there's a real sense of like satisfaction because you get to see Nora making the realizations that like life is never going to be perfect and that's a theme that I think you just grasp from the get-go. I don't think it's a spoiler. This is another one of those books that you can already see what you're supposed to get out of the book from the beginning and that just makes it even more fun because the stakes don't feel super high because she is just taking a look into all of these different lives and she gets to say the things that she always wanted to say to a person or see what would happen if she went through with this like life altering decision. I could have personally used maybe 50 more pages to get more of a sense of Nora's existence and current life um, before going into any of these things. That would have brought it from probably a 4.5 to a 5 but I really enjoyed it. Highly recommend just up my alley that like little bit of like magic meets sci-fi is just so fun. My next navy cover is Beverly Cleary's Ramona Quimby age 8 another childhood reread. This one held up more than I thought it would. Um, 
I hold firm that the Ramona and Beezus series is pretty solid. I think there are some questionable things, some out of date things, but just seeing Ramona go through life um, and learn about herself and how she is perfect just the way she is. She's not a nuisance. She doesn't have to change. It was just a really fun, um, again, nostalgic experience. I also feel the same way about the next one, which is this purple or blue? Oh no. It's okay. We're into the purples now. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom is like a classic story that so many of us have read, um, whether you were born in the 80s or 90s or 2000s. It's a classic for a reason, and this held up more than I thought it would as well. It's again a girl coming of age, uh, learning about herself and her body and her friendships and her family, how to interact with different people in her life, learning about religion and how it affects affects other people and how she wants to connect with the universe and God and it was just more um lovely than I remember and then this one my next purple book after fifth grade the world by Claudia Mills I don't have a lot to say about this one um it's about Claudia learning how to interact with her teacher um changing the ways that her school does things and coming to understand the people around her. I think I talked about it more in my childhood series video. Um, yeah, this is the one I've probably forgotten about the most since I read it. Not the most impactful. I didn't really remember reading it the way that I had visceral experiences with the other childhood favorite. So let's wrap up that collection with pink. Like pink's not in the rainbow, but we're ending with a couple pink books. This is Nothing's Fair in Fifth Grade. Clearly a fifth grade theme was going on. This was definitely my most disappointing reread. It brought back a lot of not great memories <laughs> and even as a 30 year old made me not feel so good about myself. So it's about this group of girls. There's a new girl at school, the fat girl at school. She has no character um, development besides being the fat girl and there's no exploration beyond like she likes to eat a lot so she's fat. It's about the girls um, coming to accept her and be friends with her even though she's fat and then she loses weight and she proves that she is a nice person which they didn't think she would be um, and she gets to be friends with the girls. And then lastly, it's a pinkish book. Maybe more red, maybe she's the beginning. Whoops, this made me equally sad, but for a different reason. The Death of Vivek Oji by Akwaki Emezi. This is the story of Vivek Oji. The book opens um, with his body being delivered to his mother and learning about his death. And then throughout the book, we go through different timelines and see from different perspectives the impact that Vivek had on everybody's life and the things that he was going through that impacted his day-to-day -day life and his understanding of himself and his ability to understand himself. Uh, he's growing up in a place and with people who are not as open about sexuality and gender um, and the exploration of those things and how people want to express themselves. So before he even gets a chance to really find out who he is beyond just accepting that he feels different and that everybody sees him as different, he has died. And though you know the ending from the beginning, the author just does a masterful job of keeping you engaged and interested and they just paint this incredible picture of the feeling of being unseen and unrecognized and the ways that other people talk about Vivek and the way that you see Vivek's life through Vivek's mother's eyes is just one of the most heartbreaking scenes in general. This was a really just difficult book. It was sad and it was beautifully told at the same time. So five stars without a doubt. And that's it. The 17 books that I read in the month of January. If you haven't seen anything else from me, if this is the first video you've ever stumbled upon, hi. Uh, you can go back and watch my vlogs discussing all of these more at length, but I 
I mean that pretty much summed it up so thank you so much for watching if you read any of these let me know what your thoughts were down below if you agree with me or disagree with me I love getting to chat with you in the comments about our opinions if you have any book recommendations for me anything down below would be great and I'll chat with you there bye <laughs>